You might notice that things are looking a bit different. Well, that's because I moved. I'm living in a new place now, which is part of the reason I had a bit of a hiatus this year. And hopefully I was able to take care of the echo in this room. Well, we're not going to worry about that right now because it's the Halloween season. And today we're going to be reviewing a show that takes place in the most horrifying place imaginable. High school. Gravedale High was a short-lived animated series produced by Hanna-Barbera. It only lasted for one season consisting of 13 episodes that originally aired on NBC between September and December of 1990. And that's about all I can tell you because this show seems to have just kind of come and gone and seems to have been forgotten about over the years. But today, we're going to exhume this corpse from its resting place and examine it. Let's take a look at Gravedale High. So at the titular Gravedale High, there's a class of students that are troublesome and rowdy, I guess even by monster standards, but a human teacher named Max Schneider does his best to set them straight. But of course, it won't be easy. Schneider is voiced by Vince Clorthos, the key master himself, Rick Moranis. Thanks again for the personalized parking plot. I'm honored. This was coming off his success in previous films, and the show was intended to be a way to help him further his acting career. In fact, the full title of the show is Rick Moranis in Gravedale High. It's a shame the show didn't last very long. God, Rick Moranis has the worst luck, doesn't he? The class consists of Vinny Stoker, a vampire whose name is an obvious reference to Bram Stoker, the author of Dracula. Vinny is the kid everyone wants to be, a certified 80s cool guy. Even though this was 1990, but, you know, it's still kind of close. But, uh, look, don't question me, all right? I know what I'm talking about. Well, Vinny, you've landed just in time to tell us all about your science project. Yo, my project is being cool. And as you can see, Peach, I've got it down to a science. Vinny's like the Fonz, if the Fonz was undead. Doozer, who's a Gorgon, like Medusa... Doozer, Medusa, get it? Well, thankfully she seems to have her stone gaze under control, but she's still a bit of a troublemaker, and she's voiced by Kimmy Robertson. Now this is music. The bleeding ulcers. Gee, I don't think Mr. Schneider's into them, Dooz. Schneider? Get a wife, Cleo. I'm shopping for Doozer. Reggie Moonshroud, who's a nerdy werewolf, voiced by Barry Gordon. Uh, actually, this mixture appears to be a medicinal solution of magnesia mixed in with pink dye number 16. Blanche, who's a zombie named after the main character from A Streetcar Named Desire, for some reason. But it does give her a very charming southern accent. Thank you, Mr. Schneider, but I really couldn't have done it alone. You see, I've always depended on the kindness of monsters. Oh, I do declare, Stanley, your brains are looking mighty tasty. Hospitals hold bad memories for me, J.P. Last time I was in one, I died. Rarely I did. She also loves shopping, which is a nice play on the whole mall zombie trope. That's pretty clever. I like it. She's voiced by Sherry Belafonte, who is the daughter of singer Harry Belafonte, who's known for Deo, a.k.a. the Banana Boat song, and Jump in the Line, both of which were featured in Beetlejuice. A very appropriate connection. Frank Welker voices Frankentyke, a pint-sized Frankenstein monster with an attitude. Sometimes I wonder if Penny Stoker even knows I'm alive. <laughs> this is juicy stuff, man. As you've probably guessed, Welker is all over the show, lending his voice to many characters. Rick and Rick, Rick and Rick have rabies! <laughs> man Jug! Man Jug! Guys, Frank Welker's talking to himself again. He also voices another of the main students, J.P. Gastly, while doing his best Peter Lorre impression. Uh, for Monsieur Lerscago. <laughs> hey, what's the big idea? This snail's not moving. J.P. is... 
um, a gnome? Goblin? I'm not really sure. Oh, whatever, he's not that interesting. Sid, the Invisible Man, or kid, or teenager, I guess, he's voiced by Maurice LaMarche. Sid is the class clown, and he likes to do impressions, so Mo really gets to flex his acting abilities. Even though some of the references are a bit dated. I've got lots of jokes. And what about my Michael Jackson impression? There's only one king of rock and roll. Thank you. Thank you very much. And what magnificent equine specimens they are. I know my rights, see? I get a phone call, see? Sounds to me like the late Crawford. Hey, rest in pieces, kitty. Uh, Lieutenant Palumbo here. Uh, now about these missing monsters. You mind if I take a look around? Ah, yes. What kid doesn't laugh themselves silly to a Columbo reference? Hey, I just realized something. He's not wearing pants. Like, his body is invisible and the clothes go over it, right? So, yeah. Dude's freeballing. I guess he likes to feel the breeze. Also, can we take a moment and appreciate Welker and LaMarche did voices for the real Ghostbusters and are now in a show with Rick Moranis, who was in the Ghostbusters movies? I love it when stuff connects like that. There's Cleo, who's a mummy. Her full name is Cleo Fatra. Because she's fat. <laughs> oh, couldn't get away with that nowadays. She's voiced by Ricky Lake. Hospitals are great! I got a full rewrap for free! Yep, before she had her popular talk show in the 90s, she started out as an actress. Though this was her only voice role until about 2004. Finally, there's Gil, the Gil Man. Whoa, sorry I'm late, teacher dude, but there were some bodacious waves breaking down in the swamp. <laughs> Can't have a show like this without a gnarly surfer, dude. I could totally see him hanging out with Michelangelo and Fender from Toxic Crusaders. <laughs> By the way, you are never going to guess who voices him. Jackie Earl Haley. Check this out, little dude. I'm hanging six. Yes, that Jackie Earl Haley. Everyone's favorite cinematic psychopath. Most of the time. Believe it or not, he got his start doing voice acting, going as far back as the early 70s. In fact, his very first role was in another Hanna-Barbera show. He was Jamie in the controversial Wait Till Your Father Gets Home. I've got some homework to do. I thought you did it this afternoon. I did. This is Charlie Taylor's homework. He pays me 10 cents. You're taking 10 cents to do someone else's homework? I don't think I approve. I don't either, but that's all he can afford. I think it's safe to say he has had quite a career. The school is run by Headmistress Crone, who runs the school with a literal iron fist. Mr. Schneider, please try to control your class. I know you're in there somewhere, Mr. Schneider. And yet she's still not as scary as my grade school principal. Speaking of scary, there's also Coach Cadaver, who's not too fond of humans. Though he's voiced by comedy legend Jonathan Winters. Well, if you ask me, it's all Schneider's fault. I told you not to hire a human. <laughs> Whatever happened to Monster Prime? Fortunately, though, not all of the staff is hostile to Max. Like Miss Dirge. Ah, uh, yes, we all come here to unwind between classes. Would you care to join me? It is tempting, Miss Dirge. But there's no way I can relax until I find out if Sid is all right. Come on, Schneider. Some people would pay good money for that kind of thing. There's a few other staff as well, but one worth mentioning is Mr. Tutner, who is voiced by Tim Curry. But for some reason, he wasn't really seen that much. Morning, Mr. Tutner. <laughs> Morning, Schneider. Wait a minute, let me get this straight. You had Tim Curry in your show, and you barely used him? The hell's wrong with you? So as you've probably guessed, the show mostly revolves around the students getting into problems, which will lead to them learning some kind of lesson, and hopefully hijinks will ensue along the way. I've mentioned many times before that I'm not really a fan of shows about school, and it's partly because I just find the setting boring. 
I mean, there's only so much you can do with that kind of thing. Even when you dress it up with something wacky like monsters, you always get a lot of the same situations. You know, there'd be a misunderstanding or someone would come up with a crazy scheme. We just buy this dress, we use it to win the fashion show prize, we get enough money for me to go to Schneider's dinner, then we return the dress for a full refund and we get back to class's money. Are we brilliant or what? Then something will go horribly wrong and someone learns a lesson. I mean, this is stuff you've probably seen before. Like owning up to your mistakes, don't get in over your head, solving your problems with violence is a bad idea, don't neglect your little brother just so you can get some monster nookie. You know, the usual. It's all very textbook, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad, and sometimes they manage to subvert expectations a little bit. In one episode, Gil gets noticed by a professional surfer who wants to help him become famous. So Gil starts skipping classes so he can surf more. But when the surfer guy finds out, he gets mad at Gil because he did the same thing to become famous, but ultimately has nothing to show for it. I never told Gil to quit. Why would I? So he could end up living like this? I got cheated out of all my money because I didn't know better. And I didn't know better because I never finished high school. Typically, he would be portrayed as the bad guy and be a bad influence, but it was nice to see it done a bit differently. In another episode, Cleo gets obsessed with an actor on a TV show, and I love the fact that it's clearly a parody of the old Beauty and the Beast TV series. Oh, Beast, my love. I've missed you terribly. And I you, my darling Trudy. You, sir, are no Ron Perlman. Yeah, I kid, but that's actually Phil Hartman, who's always great. Oh, your heart's pounding like a drum. <laughs> yes, my angel. It usually does after climbing a 100-story building. Hi, I'm Phil Hartman. You might not remember me from such bit parts as The Beast from Gravedale High. Anyway, Cleo wants to meet him, but is a bit insecure, so she has Doozer stand in and go on a date with him. This is messed up, right? Like, an actor going on a date with a teenage fan? I mean, I don't know if things are different for monsters, but... You know what, I'm just gonna go ahead and say that this is not cool. Well, it's not like anything happens, and he's even understanding with Cleo about not being honest. It's another one that was done pretty well. I look awful. My life is over. Again. Come on now, this one has that Cleo cover girl look. No, my wrapping is way too loose. Though I feel like this would be a little bit more impactful if her name wasn't Cleo Fatra. Each character seems to have at least one episode dedicated to them. Except JP, because like I said, he's boring. Though we get to see some of the other background characters along the way who are surprisingly memorable. I think my favorite might be Busby, who's an obvious reference to the fly. The whole school is buzzing over it! It makes a good fly swatter! Help me! Interestingly though, the one that got the most focus was probably Frankentike. He got at least three episodes dedicated to him and was a big part of several others. Two of his episodes even involved family members. There was one where his older brother showed up to school who was a popular and well-known graduate of Gravedale High. He's also a bit of a ladies' man. I guess chicks dig neck bolts? In another, he's ashamed to bring his father to school because, of course, his father is a human mad scientist. Look, Frankentag's father is a human. Yeah, my dad's human. So what? He made me what I am today. And I love him. I love you too, son. I'm guessing they wanted him to be like the face of the show or something. Also, I feel like they tried to make him a bit like Bart Simpson, because he punctuates every sentence he says with man. Hey, I missed you at lunch, man. You mean like, hey, man? Heads up, man. 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 Pardon me while I barf, man. One thing I really like about this show, though, is how well the students get along with each other. I mean, they have their fair share of problems, but for the most part, they all seem to be on the same page. Vinny even sticks up for Reggie when he gets bullied. I like when they portray the cool kid as not just some arrogant jerk. On top of that, they all like Schneider. Yeah, despite being a rowdy group of troublemaking monsters, they appreciate him for believing in them. You took over the class of misfit kids that I was ready to expel. Uh, deep down, they're just normal kids. Normal monster kids. You know, this show is way more wholesome than I expected it to be. 
And even though there's constant danger and grossness, Schneider actually likes being a teacher there. In fact, there was an episode where he went to go teach at another school, but came back because it was a school for snobby rich jerks and he felt like he couldn't make a difference there. Gee, Tucker, these books look interesting. What subjects are you taking? Junk bond management, destabilizing third world nations, and starting your own savings and loan with no money down. Oh boy. Well, I think we all know who went to that school. Good to know, because the local humans don't seem to be too fond of their monster neighbors. I like that they established some don't really seem to mind them, but most of them give the usual reactions. <laughs> Though the monsters don't really seem to mean them too much harm, for the most part they seem to just be living their lives. An invisible man! Please don't hurt us, we're just kids! Hey, I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm a kid too, except I'm invisible. They're just kind of intimidating, and they find humans to be kind of weird. I'm not used to driving on human roads, Cleo. I must observe and follow their peculiar habits. Ah! Ah! It's clearly just meant to be funny, but I did notice they dropped a few darker jokes here and there. Whoa, a snack bar. Ooh. <laughs> uh, people needed that blood. Oh, kids today are so frisky. And so are the cats. <laughs> he loses more lives that way. And on that note, I think we should wrap this up. Gravedale High might not be one of the best shows ever. The animation isn't great, and it's pretty derivative of a lot of other sitcoms and shows about school. I've even heard it compared to Welcome Back, Cotter, which seems to be pretty appropriate. But it has a lot of great talent behind it, some fun, memorable characters, and it seems to be made with good intentions, so I can't get too upset with it. I'd say give it a watch to see if you like it, but sadly it never got any kind of home release and can only be found unofficially on YouTube, hence the not so great footage I've been using. And as far as I know, the only merchandise it spawned was a small line of McDonald's Happy Meal toys. Man, this is kind of sad. I guess they're not too bad by fast food toy standards. Hey, check it out, it's Vinny. And of course, he spins. I doubt a show like this could ever make a comeback. I think the concept of Monster School has been done to death. No pun intended. Heck, anime alone seems to have that covered. Gee, I wonder why. But hey, if the characters from Scooby-Doo and the Ghoul School can return for an episode of OKKO, OK then I guess anything is possible. Well, that takes care of that, and maybe for the next video I'll dig through the archive and find something else obscure to review. Who knows? But until then, thanks for watching, and happy Halloween. All the school bells are ringing, now it's time to begin. It's about our school that we're singing, where the misfits get in. Spin! <laughs>